Welcome everyone to the next IITE online seminar. So today it is our very own Chris Terry who's going to be giving a talk about coexistence theory and whether coexistence theory fulfills the promise that it promises us, whatever that might be, which we might <laughs> learn about in real settings. So Chris, please go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Kiri. So yes, I'm gonna take the seminar in a little more of an applied angle than we often go. And basically ask, so can coexistence theory fulfill its promise in real settings. And so I guess for the context of the seminar, theory isn't just the development of new equations. And I hope we can get into some new perspectives on quite what some of these old equations might be telling us. So the, is, this, is, this, is the screen sharing okay, actually? I've lost the green border, by the way. It's perfectly fine. Uh, okay, cool, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> Sorry. So often as theoreticians, we can get ourselves into quite a narrow alleyway on these things and kind of lose the wider perspective. So to start today, I'm going to first zoom out all the way to one of the sort of core challenges of ecology, right? So explaining the distribution of species now and into the future. Now, a huge part of that is clearly just the environment, which in principle could be tackled en masse with basic, basic species distribution models. But often these don't work great for various reasons. So kind of the question we have is, why isn't a species observed in all the areas we think it probably should live? And then to this, there's probably three key answers, right? So it could just be that there's other environmental factors not built into our models. It could be that some kind of dispersal limits, like either through time or some sort of barrier is stopping things. But then there's a third, and this is probably of particular interest to theory, and that's interactions with other species. And a large chunk of that can probably be tackled with coexistence theory in all its various guises. And so kind of within that, we have sort of modern coexistence theory, which takes a particular angle, which I appreciate that most of this audience probably aren't going to need much introduction to. Um, but just to start from a fixed place, in many ways, it's better described, I guess, as a framework than a particular theory. I was getting a bit semantic, but it's an approach characterized by an emphasis on invasion analysis uh, as measured by the sign of the long term population growth rate when rare. And it's frequently coupled with some kind of partitioning, whether that's into niche and fitness differences or maybe different processes by which variability can influence invasion. Now, this focus on the capacity to invade tends to draw the focus away from population dynamics, but it allows the analysis and comparison of all kinds of complicated processes in one go. And it's super influential. It forms the core of most uh, kind of advanced undergrad ecology courses and has led to many developments in its own right. I mean, one of the classic examples is effectively disproving the concept of the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. Right? And the theory is like fantastically deep and rich. And so I've plucked a typical equation rich page from Guri's great monographic review just to kind of highlight this. But it's probably fair to say that the theory has accelerated quite far past the empirical understanding. This gap is sort of got kind of so wide that this sort of idyllic feedback of theory and empirical work that we always kind of want to get to isn't really operating too smoothly. Um, so today I'm going to try and have a kind of hard look at this interface and maybe see what can be done and what the problems might be. I think some of it is that despite being around for, for decades, really, coexistence theory still sees itself as sitting in, in quite a pioneering stage, I guess, where quite sweeping assumptions are, are fairly acceptable and alignment with the data doesn't matter too much. And Lots of this has been great, right? And there's lots and lots of value. But the real goal would if we can get it from this pioneering stage into a bit more of a common practice stage, I guess, right? And so why should theory care about relatability to data? And even if you don't care about any practical purposes at all, one key reason is that theory often ends up basically saying that the direction of an impact is dependent on the parameters. So a key feature of much modeling is the ease with which the impact of some driver can be reversed in a different context, even in really quite simple systems. So here's like a purely illustrative example of some simulations I uh, put in a review paper, which is trying to pitch um, modern coexistence theories at all to a more empirical audience. And each panel looks at time to colonization as some aspect of variability changes. And in each case, flicking some switch leads to a reversal in the impact of variability. And it really wasn't very hard to find these cases. Um, and they kind of show that until theory engages with what these parameter values actually are, we're just going to be left with an awful lot of 
uh, what ifs and dependencies, really. On the flip side, empiricists need to sort out some kind of organizing framework to cut through the thickets of complications that are out there. And the radical simplifications of modern coexistence theory into this single widely applicable criterion of the invasion growth rate offer a huge potential for that. So what then is standing in the, in the way of the wider application? So I think it can be help, helpful to split the challenges into two um, because they have quite different kind of causes and, and consequences. So first off, I guess, are the internal problems. And so these encompassing the practical problems of applying the framework to data. And then there's the more, I've called them existential problems. That's probably getting a bit too philosophical, but I, I, I couldn't think of a better word, really. But these are around the kind of assumptions that lie behind the theory and really how applicable they are to the real world. And I think generally we are well used to acknowledging these, but perhaps not engaging with them as directly as would be helpful. But in many ways, the key question actually isn't if they are an issue, we kind of know they, they can be, but exactly how much they matter. And that's fundamentally an empirical question, really. And so in this talk, I'm going to run through each of these categories in turn, with the internal, starting with the internal problems. And this is probably most easily discussed by focusing on just a single kind of approach within modern coexistence theory. So I'm going to focus on kind of a particular recipe that's rapidly becoming kind of standard approach. But much of what I'm going to talk about applies equally to other approaches, like harnessing big observational data sets or, or fitting to time series. But just for simplicity, um, the basic design that I'm going to look at uh, basically conducts a single generation of pairwise competition response surface experiments. Uh, and these vary the amount of intro and interspecific competition a species receives. And this is frequently crossed by some kind of treatment. So here I've drawn fertilizer, but it can be water levels, can be temperature, mycorrhizae, presence of natural enemies, whatever really. And the fecundity of each species and the presence of competitors is then fit with, with some kind of competition model. So here we have a beverton holt model, which is used to find some parameters, which can then be used to determine some key coexistence quantities. So there's obviously a variety of options here for defining niche and fitness differences. I'm just sort of going with the, the classics here. Um, but this then can be used to explore the influence of the treatment um, on, in, in coexistence. And so there's going to be a fair few of these coexistence plane diagrams coming up. So just in case they're unfamiliar for anybody, they show the balance between niche and fitness differences, basically. And in this gray zone on the right, I don't, know if, I don't know if you can see the mouse, but in this kind of area here, fitness differences between the species don't overwhelm the niche differences, implying that coexistence is possible. And if the fitness ratios are kind of significantly more different from one in either direction, you can get a situation where one species can exclude the other. And so for in this particular example, the addition of fertilizer shifts the system from species one excluding two into a state of predicted coexistence. Yeah, all wonderful. And loads of studies have done this now, so following this recipe. So for a recent review I did with Dave Armitage, we found 27 of these up until 2022. Uh, regularly hitting impactful journals with, with plenty more since then, and I'm sure many more in the works. It's largely been dominated by grass and species, but has included others such as Drosophila and duckweeds and yeasts and, and so on, all sorts. Okay, great. This all seems wonderful. But the core problem we have is really just how noisy biology is. We all kind of know this, but you know, we close our eyes to, to it as much as we can quite often. And particularly within modern coexistence theory studies, with its focus on prediction outcomes, it's actually amazingly rare to get the raw data plotted out. And if it is, it's deeply buried in SI. But we frequently get orders of magnitude of variation between the observations that kind of go into this early recipe here. This was just a nice puzzle and error, nice and tidy. But that's rarely what we actually get when we look at the data. So just for a couple of examples, um, well, here is something from my older Drosophila experiments where we looked at competition between six species. And here's some, here's some raw data of emerge counts against the number of founder pairs as part of an intraspecific competition assay. So apologies for the ugliness. It was deep in SI. Um, one of the key points, while it's possible to detect a trend and I merrily fit a line through it, individual data points span orders of variation, really. And here's a rather more beautiful graph from some other authors showing the fecundity of individual plants in isolation that they use to parameterize their models. And so note the logarithmic axis here, we've got huge, huge variation. 
And in some ways, this is going to be somewhat inevitable because the kind of species that make a good kind of study organism, these are going to be quite R selected, quick generation times, really um, kind of weedy species. They're also likely to be the ones of this wide variation as well. Now, this variance in itself isn't necessarily a problem, but it needs to be addressed carefully, not least by getting enough data. And this is easier said than done, though. And data desires sort of quickly get out of hand, really. And especially given that we have tend to be some upper limit in resources that we can invest, there's an inevitable tension between the number of species pairs investigated and the accuracy with which we know each pair. Um, so that, let's say we wanted to look at the competition between six species under two treatments. Even with the simplest models, that will mean six growth rates and 36 competition terms. Then across each treatment and then plus and error terms, all of this building in, if we aim for 20 data points for observation, we're easily looking at thousands of um, experiments needed, which can quickly get beyond, beyond feasible capacity. But when I was doing the sort of review of studies I mentioned earlier, it's quite alarming how hard it is to get at the raw data and actually how rare reporting what the underlying kind of N behind it is. And even when the number was given, it's often really quite hard to interpret because it's much easier to run the kind of monoculture trials that down in this part. You get these imbalances. So actually the N might be enormous, but the amount of data that lies behind the competition coefficients in particular, it's often really, really quite small. So I'll flag at this point that clearly this isn't exactly a new point, and the field has come up with various approaches to pool information, whether that's traits, or phylogeny, or sparse modeling, or, or whatnot. And this offers lots of opportunity, but it's still going to need to build from, from a decent core. OK, so problem two. And again, this isn't going to be news to anyone, really. But our models of competition are almost entirely phenomenological. We're basically fitting a best fit line to some curved data, or approximately curved data, we often assume it is. And only really have the quality of that fit to choose between the myriad of options to do this. Now, maybe a ray of light is that much of the time we care specifically about only two quantities. So that's the kind of carrying capacity and, and the competition exerted on the other at that point. But nonetheless, it's really easy to show that different, completely plausible models will give quite radically different predictions. So here's an example I knocked together in, in that review. And to note, this is synthetic data um, using a three parameter model. It's got way less noise than most real data sets. Um, so here we're just looking at whether species A can invade species B and testing out a standard set of models I've got over on the left, all of which just use two parameters to describe competition. So in this first graph, I fit the growth rate of species A in monoculture to determine its carrying capacity. And looking at this kind of lineup, only one or maybe two, if you're generous, capture it correctly. And nobody's, I hope, really going to claim that that blue line, the linear uh, lock or terror model, is, is really a good fit, even though it gets it right. Um, and then looking at the other kind of flip side, so the population growth rate of species B in the context of A at that fitted um, carrying capacity we just found, we again get a variety of lines and a variety of estimates for the invasion growth rate, which have quite poorly capture where the, sort of, the truth is. Now, this is obviously just synthetic data, but I didn't have to try too hard to build this example. And the, these articles by others have some, some real examples of this actually in practice affecting, affecting results. And to make things worse, it's not just the competition kernel. The, sort of the function used to describe the error can really, really matter too. And similar to competition models, there isn't much of a mechanistic basis for a priori selection of what, what we should be doing. Um, so fitting the same model, assuming either Gaussian or Poisson or negative binomial errors, can give quite different parameter fits as different parts of the data are em emphasized. Or, or sort of by different parts of the data, I mean different sort of um, uh, predictive variables. Kind of you have more to one part or the other, it can skew your model fit quite a lot. Um, I'm not going to show any examples here in the interest of time, but there's there's some in the review, and I'm going to see some later with some real experiments I do. Some people also actually are trying kind of fitting to log transformations, which can cause absolute havoc later down, if not if not um, careful as well. OK, so this is all very well. Um, the real question is, what do we actually do about it? And the sort of first instinct answer is basically model selection. Um, but really, that's not quite as straightforward as we might hope, because the first question we have is, well, what is it we're actually trying to select for? Um, 
so in this case, all the models have the same number of parameters. So it isn't really a case of picking the most parsimonious one. Um, but where they are a different number of parameters, then you have a whole world of it using uh, or deciding which information criteria is actually the best one to use. So staying in a kind of non-Bayesian world for the moment, conventionally we have a choice between approaches a bit like AIC, which are optimized for selecting the model that will give the best prediction, or kind of in the worldview of BIC, which exerts a stronger parameter penalty to kind of optimize picking the best model. And these are quite distinct, to be honest. But for modern coexistence theory, there's really quite a distance between the models we're kind of fitting to our raw data and our end goal, which is sort of several transformations and manipulations along the line. We don't actually want the best general predictor of new data. What we want is the best description of the carrying capacity and the effect of competition. And we don't really believe the real model is actually in the set of models we're comparing. And when we're doing this comparison, it it often depends a lot of our choice of um, how do you say, values of predictors that we use. If we have lots of data from low amounts of competition, not much data around the really key point of this carrying capacity, we end up selecting all of that explains what we've got really well, but doesn't really necessarily do a much good job of predicting the key bit we actually need. So what can we do about this? Obviously, you know, doing standard model um, model selection through an AIC or something like that, you know, has to be part of the story. Um, just taking a model off the shelf, I mean, I've done it myself, so I'm just guilty, guilty as charged, but it's really, really risky for making predictions. Probably the only safe thing we can really do is actually just compare the end predictions of other plausible models. If the predictions are the same, great, the conclusion is probably fairly robust. If not, then we need to be much more cautious in the conclusions we're making and taking forward. Okay, so next problem, third problem. Once the model is sorted, the other aspect of uncertainty is in the values of those parameters that we've kind of fit within our model. There's off to a bit of a kind of slow start, but it's increasingly common to see propagation of uncertainty through to coexistence outcomes, whether that's through bootstrapping or Bayesian approaches or you know, whatever. Although it's important to bear in mind that this is uncertainty given a particular model, which can be quite a big stretch. So one trend I've seen when fitting these models is that those that have Poisson errors can be wildly overconfident in their predictions. So it might look from the end, oh, I've done the, um, I propagated the uncertainty through and it looks really tight, but actually that's all stemming because it's just the best fit given that data, given that model and data. Uh, it doesn't really capture the uncertainty in the kind of wider scheme of the models. So a couple of other further points really is that this uncertainty is not evenly distributed across the classes of parameters that need to be fit. So in particular, the alphas are almost always much more uncertain than the potential fecundity, so the lambdas in, in most of these models. And basically this comes from having less data because it's normally possible to run a whole load of solo individual assays. But also in a multi-species experiment, all observations of a species will inform the lambdas but each alpha will only be informed by you know, particular combinations of competition trials. And so in examples I've looked at, the standardized standard deviation seems to be about twice as uncertain for alphas than lambdas. And this can have a major consequences when it comes to partitioning coexistent drivers. Uh, for a real example, here are some posterior distributions from this old um, six species fly experiment. So again, SI figure, apologize, apologies for the dreadful colors. Um, but what I plotted out here is for each of the 15 species combinations, the relative uncertainty of the two components of the fitness differences. So that's the competitive response ratio and the demographic ratio. And it's just way wider in the competition part. Right? So this matters because it can start to generate spurious results when looking at differences between those treatments. It would be great to know what is driving changes to coexistence. Is it due to changes in interactions or is it due to changes to the fundamental performance of these species? But if we expect some parts to appear to change more than others just by chance, we have a problem as any analysis will be biased towards pointing the finger at competition. So a design that's been used basically goes a bit like this, taking data from the two treatments and comparing how these two aspects change, but, but how much this is real. So one way to examine the size of the possible artifact is to fit a model with no treatment effect, simulate from it fake data, um, and then just repeat the analysis and see what happens. So I've done this for a recent study and basically found it can reproduce the 
the re reported effect. The challenge, though, is what to do next. And that, that's a bit harder. So just because something could be an artifact, of course, doesn't mean it actually is. Um, so I won't get too much further into this, but loads more detail. There's some matters arising coming out on this soon. There's no easy answers, really, but some kind of null model is probably needed to try and subtract off um, this kind of artifact effect. It gets very techy very quickly. Um, another part we definitely need is statistical support for a treatment effect kind of before we go any further in, in testing out which effect is, is larger. We need to know, are we confident it's not just noise? Wait, a final point into this probably far too deep dive into, into model fitting um, is a quick point about correlations. So when fitting these models, it's really common that parameters are just not very independent of each other. So with the standard kind of fairly starry sky of data we end up with, in you know, the line that we're fitting could plausibly be in a load of places. But it tends to be that a lower fecundity will be coupled with a lower effect of competition. And this has a few consequences, one of which is actually good news. The positive covariance tends to mean that overall uncertainty in these inequalities is it's probably less uncertain than if they were not correlated at all. But it also means we have to be extra careful with how we propagate uncertainty through this. So we know from raw theory that Venetian fitness differences are deeply, deeply intertwined because they, they share the same parameters and nothing else. But this kind of correlations induces further extra complications. And if you plot out the full posteriors, they end up with these sort of weird banana shapes that kind of defy the classic crossed error bars and make it sort of extra important to propagate uncertainty all the way through to whatever end result is, is of interest. OK, I'll, I'll, it's enough on the model fitting. I, I hope I've convinced you that applying modern coexistence theory to empirical systems really isn't just a simple recipe. Um, that it's pretty easy to go way off track, if not if not careful. Exactly how impact all of this has been on our understanding to date is, is quite hard to tell, really. So again, this review I did with Dave Armitage last year, I did a survey of all the papers I could find that applied modern coexistence theory to experimental data. And we picked out four categories of things to kind of fairly arbitrary rate things on. So there's availability of raw data, testing of the functional form, reporting of parameter uncertainty and reporting of uncertainty in the kind of predictions out the other end. We kind of rated each paper. It's a bit subjective, both in terms of which papers are included and, and the kind of grading. So we, we didn't do any qualitative analysis on this, but there are a few trends worth, worth picking up, I guess, in that generally through time, things are getting better. It's getting to more dark green, uh, but there's still a long way to go, particularly with testing different models. Um, this is a particular problem that the vast majority of papers, including, I should say, mine, mine's in its own table and did this too, just followed past precedent and picked a Belton hot model. And it's quite hard to tell the impact of this on kind of conclusions. Um, quite a few of the key papers are from a time before the data was public available, uh, publicly available, so I couldn't really go back and check, but it's likely to possibly have some impact on what's going on. OK, let's take a look at sort of the other class of challenges of modern coexistence theory, which I labeled earlier as kind of existential ones. So, so far in this talk, we basically taken modern coexistence theory as representing some sort of golden truth, which we have to kind of coerce our messy data into somehow. Um, but it's not going to come to a surprise to, to most here that there are some serious issues with this. Um, so some major ones in, in no particular order. Basic modern coexistence theory is, is fundamentally pairwise. Yet we know species exist in diverse communities with all the wonderful and complex dynamics that brings. So may, you know, this is almost certainly definitely somewhat a problem. On kind of the optimistic side, both species abundance distributions and network ecology tell us that most interactions are relatively weak and there's sort of a few strong interactions that dominate things. So perhaps for a decent number of species, simplified representation can actually get us almost all the way. So grasslands where so many of these experiments are done are, are probably a bit of an exception to this, where everything competes with everything else quite a lot. Uh, second up, we have the assumption of infinite time and space horizons, right? And so this has been the nub of a fair bit of discussion in these seminars already. And the nub of it is that vanilla MCT, at least, works by taking long-term averages. But we know the world is noisy and discrete, which can play havoc with predictions by causing you know, extinctions of small populations, despite the long-term growth rates actually being, being positive. And thirdly is trying to align up spatial scales. 
So most, although not, not all, um, coexistence type studies assume a single homogeneous patch, which can you know, totally represent, uh, misrepresent the situation. And the scale of apparent coexistence we observe may be propped up by environmental heterogeneity that, that just isn't included. Um, and then there's also the challenge of positive density dependence. The whole concept of invading from rare is pretty hard to square with alley effects. And lastly, for now, vanilla modern coexistence theory doesn't really account for any possible trait changes in response to environmental change. Right, okay, so obviously I'm not going to be able to solve sort of any of these now. Um, there's some really interesting work to try and relax the assumptions that lie behind some of these, but kind of as, as important as that is, it's, it's hard to see how these aren't going to create sort of even further data issues. And so if we're somewhat struggling to apply the kind of basic modern coexistence theory, I'm, I guess I'm a little skeptical, skeptical about how well we can extend to more sophisticated extensions, I guess. So usually, ooh, ooh. So usually the approach is to, um, to argue that the analytic advantages of these assumptions are worth it, and that it's just the best framework we have, right? And to some extent, that's true for a number of cases, but for lots of predictions, there are kind of correlation-based approaches waiting off stage as an alternative. So I think there isn't really a substitute for actually just testing how much all of these problems actually matter in, um, with, with experiments, basically. So to make this kind of step beyond just comparing predictions, we need to make big validations, basically. And hopefully, eventually, we'll get to a stage where we don't need to validate every time, because some cases will just be straight up impossible to validate. Um, but where we can, we, we really, really should. Because at the moment, for we know we might well just be discussing sort of better sort of horoscopes of predictions. You know, we add more detail and more complication, but we might still not really be on a firm enough ground. So possible tests that people can do is our um, plausibility tests. So this is just checking whether the predicted equilibria densities from these models kind of make any sense. Another way is comparing to observed distributions across space, and this can offer great additional support, but is a real challenge to align the scales appropriately. Working with historical time series can be really useful too. Um, but the tests I'm going to talk about now are probably the most direct, which is to use mesocosms with a fast enough life history where we can actually observe the population dynamics on a reasonable time scale and kind of see what we want to see with, with our species. So in principle, and I'm going to bring in a kind of climate change element to this to put a bit of dynamics in it, is that if we have a prediction for how environmental change will, will carry on, an understanding of species coexistence in different environments, we should be able to make coexistent predictions across those environments aligned with the expected changes and essentially predict the future. Um, and particularly around when the species should go extinct, um, or the flip side of colonizing, to be honest, as well. Now, strictly speaking, this, this just shouldn't work because it breaks a whole bunch of assumptions embedded in modern coexistence theory. But if we stuck with all these assumptions, then we, we couldn't reapply really it to anything. So the real question is, is does it matter? So, so over the summer, I ran an experiment with some Drosophila to kind of just test that, really, I guess. So I haven't submitted it quite yet. So any feedback on this is, is, is still really welcome. The basic background is we have this community of Australian Drosophila, and they come from rainforest mountains with a really strong temperature gradient. And through a variety of field sampling and experiments over many years, we we know their distribution is set by a mixture of temperature and, and competition. And so from that kind of community of about a dozen or so species, I picked out two. So this is Drosophila polydifrons and Drosophila pandora to work with. And polydifrons are basically a bit larger and it favours cooler environments, while pandora is a bit smaller and likes it warmer. And we expect the temperature increase will shift the dominance kind of from uh, polydifrons to pandora. And the question is, how well can our coexistence theory predict when polydiphrons will be driven out um, in a warming environment? So the basic design used um, standard Drosophila vials to create nice discrete generations, aligning with the uh, discrete theory kind of worldview. And so every kind of tip of the flies, I did a full census and raised the incubator temperature by 0.4 degrees. And in the basic treatment, I just had polydiphrons. And then in another treatment, I added small numbers of this invader Pandora intervals kind of through time. And in the further kind of treatment cross, instead of just a steady rise in temperature, I introduced generational scale environmental heterogeneity uh, following one of these 12 different pathways. Um, and here's the experiments on the left. They're kind of really quite small scale, but massively replicated. 
So I had 60 replicates per treatment. So in total, 240 populations tracked for, for 10 generations. And so, yeah, I, I counted you know, tens of thousands of flies. It was an entertaining summer in that sense. Um, but the really key number is the number of usable transitions I had. So I had basically you know, a few, low, low thousands numbers of um, total transitions from sort of some number of flies to, well, another number of flies that might be zero. Um, and this lets me fit really, really quite a lot. But you probably thought of a few issues here. So partly this is much more data than normal. It's probably a, a green flag for my, my experiments. But there's a whole bunch of red flags and problems here in that we've got fairly strong demographic stochasticity in, in these tiny vials. I don't offer any possibility of recolonization um, by the kind of focal species, polydiforms. And I don't have any sort of dispersal dynamics in here. Um, so this is roughly what the data looks like, just to give you a sense of the experiment. So um, just the counts of the females. There's a lots of variation on their route to extinction. Um, but by generation 10, essentially all the populations of plidiforms were extinct. And note the, the wild fluctuations that we've, we've got through going on through there. And these are all sort of real. You know, my, my counts are pretty sure were pretty much accurate. Um, so the question is, can coexistence theory make accurate predictions of the time to extinction? And so to do this, to fit the population model, I basically need three parts. So a thermal performance function for the base fecundity, a temperature dependent competition kernel, and some kind of representation of the error. And kind of, I kind of fit all these parts in a modular way um, to kind of build up the best model I can. So in terms of the thermal performance curve, there's dozens and dozens of functional forms that mostly look quite similar. And because there's been tons of Drosophila experiments, we basically know that it should look like this shape. So I tested a few functions that worked. I'd love to say it was built on model selection, but basically actually only this one uh, was able to fit with any degree of confidence. So I just run with that, but the, these form such overlapping shapes. I think it shouldn't matter too much for, for, for predictions. The competition, competition kernel on the other hand is a lot less clear expectations. So I went through a whole iterative process of testing different model forms and temperature dependence and running through model comparison um, these were all fitted in STAN, so it's using um, ELPD LU, but it's essentially an AIC type approach. Um, and a bit of just looking at the parameter values to try and get the most justifiable model I could. And so kind of crunking through this, I basically ended up with, uh, this model was coming out the best. It's basically a Belton Holt model. Uh, the exponent terms, the logging didn't really add very much at all, but with temperature dependent competition from Polydifrons, um, but actually not from the Pandora, that wasn't supported by the model by the model selection process at all. Uh, probably more useful in the equation, this is kind of how the fitted terms look when plotted out with respect to temperature. And so we get the different optimum of the two species showing through, through quite nicely, which is always reassuring. Um, and we see that sort of PAL is, uh, the polydiphrons is more susceptible to intraspecific competition and exerts less competitive pressure on PAN, the other species, at higher temperatures. So what came as a surprise to me when doing this model comparison is the error distribution used is way more influential than the core model structure. Um, it's all fairly easy to fit through the BOMS interface to stand. So we played around with lots and lots of different options of errors. Um, and when you compare these models, it's error structure that kind of came out as being the key divider, basically. And one of the, the quirks of the species is that there was for each generation a reasonable chance of total failure of each file. It can be for various reasons. Sometimes it seems the flies just don't want to lay any eggs. Sometimes there were just so many larvae that the development was so delayed that they did not mature in time to kind of transfer and make, make the cut. So I built this in with a zero inflated negative binomial distribution, which is pretty strongly favored. So sorry, Chris, there's a question in the chat that are you taking ah. questions now or just at the end? Uh, oh, the question is about taking questions. Okay. Um. <laughs> exactly, meta question. Um, I uh, Maybe better wait till the end, actually. So okay. I can, um, let's start. do that. Okay. Is that all right? <laughs> okay. Sorry, Travis. Oh. Um, where was I? I found out. So, uh, yes. So basically tying in this um, temperature dependent zero inflation, it's a little bit like tying in germination success in the grassland models. Um, it kind of works out not too bad. Okay. Out the other side of those details, um, what are the, what are the predictions we get out? So, Kind of reassuringly, the posterior predictions on the coexistence plane seem to track track quite nicely what we kind of hoped for. Um, but these are a little hard to pass. So 
here I've got the proportion of the posterior in each of those four outcomes, those sort of four quadrats, um, against temperature. And what we get is, as we kind of know from the field, what we should expect, a, a replacement of one by the other as the temperature increases. Now, the model's not too certain at all where polydiforms will be squeezed out. Uh, this is kind of essentially a cumulative probability is one way of, one way of thinking about it. Um, but the best estimate is um, kind of around here. And the fun part is we can convert these temperatures over to generations and compare them to the observed extinction points we had. But before I do that, I thought it's probably worth just taking a moment to consider what success would be in this context. I guess I, you know, I guess don't, don't don't all shout out necessarily, but like it's worth thinking what what would be a good match with data. Okay, so the fit we actually got was somewhere about here. So the observed mean um, generations to extinction, um, so when just no flies left, uh, was just over six but of a really, really broad range. I guess that's not surprising from the um, variability I showed before. Sorry, I've gone too early. There we go. Um, so question is, is this, is this any good? That's a, that's a much harder question and one which I'd love to hear any opinions at the end. So a positive view would say that given quite how many assumptions are baked into coexistence theory and how many I'm busting right through to do these predictions, the fact that there's any alignment at all is a bit of a miracle and, and kind of supports its use in the wild. You know, these big things like lack of recolonization and strong demographic stochasticity, they're both likely to hasten the observed extinctions. So it's actually quite nice that it's sort of wrong in the expected direction. But obviously a more negative view would say that the experiments set things up to be a much easier challenge than the real world. And it's not exactly that accurate and it's definitely not very precise. One interesting surprise is that when I looked at the predictions under an alternative model that just used Poisson error, so this was really not favored, but I thought I'd just look and see how it worked. The prediction was both more confident and actually more accurate. Now this isn't a model you'd pick out and it's obviously an after the fact test, but it maybe supports the robustness of the conclusion to, to model error that I was kind of talking about, about earlier. Um, it's also notable that this goes through a region of priority effects, whereas the kind of better model went through a region of coexistence. And they're offering quite different predictions in, in other ways. Um, lastly, from this experiment, I'll just put up the distribution of extinctions across those four treatments I had, in case anyone was curious. So the takeaway here is that both competition and variability hasten the extinction, but when taken together, there's no, no additional loss. And this actually gives us another point of comparison with the coexistence theory, because we can use the simulation-based empirical coexistence theory approach to determine the expected effect of variability on the dynamics. Now, in this case, as the curvature of those uh, performance curves is not particularly extreme, this basically washes out once you crank the handle through as variability having a pretty small impact on the predicted exclusion point. But this is actually exactly what we, what we see. So this comparison here is, is really quite small. So although maybe the absolute value is a bit off, the kind of the small extra effect of variability in this experiment, um, so small you can't actually detect it, is actually quite well estimated by, by coexistence theory. Okay, just to kind of return, zoom out a little bit, um, it's probably worth bearing in mind that from this list of existential problems I had before, this ex experiment only really engages with two of the five. So the assumptions of space and time limits were pretty, pretty sorely tested. Um, I haven't mentioned it yet, but it also tested the issue around positive density dependence. So these flies have a behavior where just a single pair lays way less than they do when they have more company. Um, but it seems that this alley effect only kicks in at very, very low densities. So it's probably not too much of an issue here. But clearly it doesn't affect or doesn't really speak at all to these other, these other questions here. And figuring out an appropriate baseline for success is not, is not clear either. The next challenge really is designing a better test, right? So more species and spatial dynamics seem beneficial next stepping stones, but both would be a step beyond what one person could really, really do. So, so it might be a while in the works yet. Um, yeah, so just sort of starting to wrap up. So thank you very much for sticking with me on this journey over to the empirical side. I hope it's been at least a bit of stimulation to see over the wall, as it were. Um, there's lots of challenges, both sort of internal and existential, it's probably a bit, bit wordy, but I don't think either of these are actually fatal. Um, clearly matching spatial scales of kind of 
our experiments and the real reality that we particularly care about at that time is, is going to be crucial. But in principle, it, it, it is possible. But looking sort of ahead, we've kind of had broadly the same modern coexistence theory for a few decades now. And it, it kind of feels a bit like we're reaching a sort of transition point where the tools are being widely used, but hitting up against some firm limits. So, so really, I guess, what should come next? And I, you know, I've, people sort of sometimes joke about it as post-modern coexistence theory. What, what does that mean? When... Oops, uh, where have we lost Chris? <laughs> not, not to get too far away from the analytic precision that the firm framework can bring. So I guess from a talk kind of full of problems, I'm actually quite, quite positive about the role theory can have in making useful predictions. Like we can't though keep tinkering with theory forever, we have to get out and try what we have. Um, but we would benefit from some more emphasis on making theory both old and new, robust to inevitable uncertainties. And there's a big danger in just taking fitted values of truth. Um, so the hard boundary of invasion analyses interacts quite poorly with fuzzy reality, but it, it's going to have to, basically. Um, so with that, I'll, ooh, I will say thanks to my funders and collaborators and all this sort of work, and I guess open up the floor to questions, comments, opinions, um, and anything else. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, for that great talk. So if you have any questions, then please raise your hand in the participant list. I guess we also, could go my apologies, Chris, my internet broke down for a few seconds <laughs> there. Uh, it's all right. It, the, the mystery voice came on and said the recording stopped, started. Oh, so, gosh. <laughs> what did I miss? No, um, nothing, nothing, don't worry. <laughs> it was about one second at my end anyway. Um, exactly. <laughs> uh, okay, Aksa, please go ahead. Yeah, I, as as always, I'm a bit concerned that I'm always the one raising the hand first, and, and <laughs> I, don't, I don't really want to do this, but nobody else did. By the so, way, by the way, um, um, it, it, I want to address one problem, which is the model selection bit. Yes, in, yes. and I always I'm I'm trying to I'm always arguing it's not probably not as severe in in reality as it is in experiments that people do, because in in reality we are closer to the point where. It's, Things are just about able to 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 um, exist. There's much mu a much more tougher environment, and people want to set up their experiments so that the intrinsic growth rates are rather large. And um, and then um, yes, if if you look at it at, at a single species, it's easier to understand. And if you have a single species um, close to the point where it's just about to go extinct, you can describe population dynamics by the by the normal form of transcritical verification, and we know that's unique. There is no 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 variability, so the model selection doesn't apply. But if you're further away from the point where the species is just about to go extinct, then then you have deviations from the normal form, and then you have to ask okay, which which of these deviations is correct. And I believe if you have two species or three species, the problem is similar. So in reality, we are very close to them going extinct, and then there's this linearization linearization of the in, internal. Of the of the intrinsic growth rate, which leads to the the Lotka Volterra competition model, is actually probably not so bad. Well, well, if you can't linearize anymore, then of course you you get these problems. Um, and so, uh, yes, maybe that explains also why why your your model selection is not so important as this. There's a thinking about the error term, which is more, more serious than this. Yeah, quite possibly. So I think if you're dealing with observations in the wild, then you maybe have a fairer chance of guessing where the carrying capacity could be. When you're doing these experiments and you're sowing seeds in the field, you often don't really have a sense of where this carrying capacity is to start with. So you can get in all kinds of kinds of a tangle, really, I guess, because that's kind of, I think, as you say, guessing or inferring the kind of growth rate when rare, you've got a fixed point you can kind of grab hold of. But trying to work out what the other species should be doing at that point is much, much harder. 
um, and kind of, but it's kind of quite important for coexistence theory. You can't just do the single species angle quite so easily. Um, you kind of need that that part of the puzzle to build it up. Mm -hmm. Okay, but there, I'm sure there are other comments. There was a question in between. <laughs> to, go, to go back to that, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, Travis wanted to. Yeah, Travis, did, did you want to ask a question? Oh uh, yeah, sure. So my thing was about the uh, was about the um, the the measurement model. But to go back to the model selection, um, mm. I don't think I understood the the question though because. You know, there's a lot going on here. Model selection obviously won't work if the data isn't rich enough to distinguish the differences between the different models. And so the whole point of model selection isn't necessarily to say what's actually going on, but what's going on within the context of the data. Um, it actually is supposed to keep you from having these circular kinds of discussions. So I, <laughs> the question doesn't make any sense to me. And it's the whole reason why you don't want to have those kinds of discussions. Um, <laughs> so the, the, the point that was making... my question. Sorry, let me just briefly answer to the, the, the point I was making. It probably doesn't make much, uh, uh, it's not so important in reality because we, we all, in reality, the, all the models will work very well. Because we I mean, but you don't know that a priori. Okay. Yeah, I mean, well, you, you have two things going on. One is, I mean, we could talk about this all day. I work in the microbiome, so we have lots of data and we have non, we have lots of models that, okay, here's, an, here's a perfect example. We all think that there's higher order interactions, right? Um, we might want to add a model that has the ability to tell us whether or not under the data that is a possibility. But even if we think it's there, one, having these like triple interactions are very hard to observe. So if you have trouble like going from growth rates to pairwise interactions, think about the amount of data you would need to see the triple interaction. It might not even be there. So the whole point of the model is just to say, model selection in some ways just tells you what is, what is viewable under the noise model you have, maybe not what is reality. And so, yeah, that, yeah. So that's a whole to to, to discuss. I, I guess the whole point is like posing the question the way you did defeats the purpose of having model selection in the first place, which is to keep you from speculating about that. You know, but that's not my my question. My question was about the error models. Um, hmm. Did you fit and stand? You can you have to pick the parameters for the model. So I was just curious how you picked those. So for like the negative binomial distribution, there's multiple parameterizations, but there's effectively two scale terms. Um, and it'll be really sensitive to that. So how did you fit the scale or the, the, the free design parameters for those? I mean, they were, they're part of the fitting process. So they just, they come from the, so data. they had hyper priors as well. Sorry. The negative binomial had hyper priors. Um, there were deep under the hood, some sort of hyper prior, but it's pretty, pretty loose. Um, so actually what, oh, I see is that one of the species that Pandora, that it, I mean, it's slightly hard to follow biologically but it's there in the data and that if you have more pandoras you end up with a larger scale parameter and it kind of works through the, actually i've got the labels on there but the so that each 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 species had their own negative binomial then they didn't yes, there wasn't yes. a common uh yeah um and, and really what is and what is the code. source yeah and in, in sequencing data we we know, or we think we know, that the source of the negative. Okay, so what is a negative binomial for those who aren't aware? So it's a it's a Poisson distribution where the the parameter single parameter has a beta prior, right? And so it's how you go from one parameter to two essentially. And so you have this over dispersion. And so in sequencing data, particularly for amplicon sequencing, it fits the data quite well. And we think that the over dispersion is both like sort of um, a reality of having observations, but also like the chemistry of doing the sequencing itself. And so that's at least how we tell ourselves we're right. For you though, where you're counting raw things, right? You have a really good idea of how to count. What's this, what would be the source of the over dispersion? Or is that why the Poisson works so well in the first place? Because you don't have this extra layer of uncertainty, right? Because you, you have a more of a direct measurement to what you want. Well, I think that the Poisson is sort of overly confident because it's saying like, if it was the Poisson, then this is the best estimate. Where the, where the over dispersion comes from is, it seems to be a kind of emergent environmental heterogeneity that for some reason, it seems to be pretty much by chance. You have a bunch of flies and they just get themselves all churned up, the, the larvae in particular. And they just as a group kind of do well or as a group do badly. And it's sort of, I don't have, impose any environmental 
heterogeneity. It just kind of emerges by chance that just some some vials, they just get really icky and they don't do well. And some, for whatever reason, work out nicely. So you get much bigger range per vial than you would kind of expect by any nice sort of, you know, normal generating process. Okay. Um, I see. And then I guess, so I don't want to monopolize. And the original question was just about <laughs> uncertainty, quantif- like the actual error model. But so you had questions about how like you're doing the prediction. So I didn't see it. And, you know, obviously you're probably in the paper, but, you know, you could do some like hierarchical crossfold validation type of thing. Did you do like hold out tests and where you took fractions of the data and blinded it? Because that could be a good way of doing it where you literally held out like you could start something simple, right? Train on 90 percent, predict on 10, but you could be very extreme, right? Where you're only trading on half or ten percent and four and you know showing that your predictions are robust. Yeah, so uh, the selection process I used is well L P D L O O, leave one out. You know, it's it's built on that fundamentally of kind of can you predict the one data point you've taken out from the rest of them? It kind of does that for the whole lot. Yeah. So it, I mean there's no reason to do that though, just to be clear. Like you could do yeah. you can get really extreme. If you want to show how powerful it is, there's no reason <laughs> to do one, right? I mean we do lots of things. If we want to show that it works really well, you could leave half out, right? For instance. Yes. I'm, I'm just saying you could. Yeah. Um, I mean, this, this there's no reason to. is a bit circular because I'm sort of making a prediction from kind of the same experiment. Well, so yeah, of course. It yeah, it's a super clean environment. Yeah. Kind of cut through that and you know not have that mixture up. Um, no, I mean, but it, I mean, they're individual. I mean, just like leave one out. If you, I guess my point is, if you have this this confounding with leave one out, why would the confounding be even any worse with leaving half of it out? Right. Well, I could use the different parts of the experiment I have, I guess. But um, anyway, yeah. Yeah, like of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you wouldn't. Yeah. Okay. That. But, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, uh, Eric. I think you were next. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the great talk. It was really nice to me to to see and to see the breadth of the work. So, I, the first thing I was wondering about, like looking at your estimation, is to what extent a lot of the issues about like model choice or selection could be avoided if we went for a more like using, say, a more flexible functional estimation approach. So Gaussian processes or thin plate splines or something similar for estimating these functions. Or is this the case of we? We have too limited data in the area we actually care about, so we might end up with higher uncertainty around. Like, are the are the functional ch- constraints you're choosing already for these models str- strong and are like too strong, or are they like just as strong as we need to fit the the kind of limited data we have from experiments? That's a really interesting point because yeah, there's nothing special really about these these models. They kind of they look roughly the right shape, <laughs> and you're trying to put yeah. different. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's no, there was really pretending that this is how competition works. Right? Um, I didn't do any of that on the basis that I was kind of trying to represent kind of this kind of things other people do and sort of test that. So it didn't sort of seem too helpful for those purposes to kind of go off and, and do something quite quite different. But this, yeah, it would definitely be interesting, interesting to do. Um, and it's not really much of an answer. I I, I didn't do it. I tried just fitting a kind of linear model, which I guess is the simplest end on that time. That really just didn't converge. Going up further, kind of the next step, adding a few more polynomial terms, I guess we could have done. But then you kind of have to be quite careful that you're not introducing some other weirdness or problem. I, I would say I'd be I'd be very cautious about going to high dimensional polynomials instead yeah. <laughs> of like a thin plate spines or something similar. Just you end up having very strange functional behavior outside of the range of your data. Absolutely. Uh, so that's why I was kind of sticking with ones that you know kind yeah. of exist. But um, but our GPs GPs are not doing forecasting though. GPs are doing more like fitting, like you said. Splines and GPs are not the same as what's derived from Lutka Volterra, right? Lutka Volterra can forecast, and you look at steady states. GPs you can't forecast i mean depending on they don't usually forecast many many days in advance so it means it's two totally different things right you, you can you could use a swine or a g like you could fit like a if you're fitting like the coefficient like the competition inter and inter specific coefficient or competition functions with splines and gps or gps you could just as easily use that to forecast out Simon would actually had a paper on like partially like partially parametric population forecasting i think is related to this 
like replacing some of our components for, for population forecasts with, with non-parametric functions. But there is an issue that non, any non-parametric function, you have to be very careful what is behavior sort of extrapolation. So like outside of the, which I think does sometimes hit in our, our data sets where we were like, okay, do we, do we actually have the data to parameterize these things at equilibrium or at zero density? Yeah, I mean, particularly with these experiments, you kind of don't really have that key point because almost by definition, if you don't, you know, if you don't have a fly, then it's not going to lay any eggs. But actually, that's the point you want, right? The invasion rate from rare is is that exact point that you don't you don't really have functionally rare available to you. It's, it's interesting, actually. We're running into a similar issue that we run into in fisheries a lot, where trying to estimate like we have data at equilibrium, but what we actually care about for setting targets is is low demand, like low density growth rates, mm. and I, I, it's not something I think as a field we have anywhere close to solved anyway, or if it is solvable. <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, Steve, please go ahead. Or has Steve left? Uh, I cede uh, the floor to Peter. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. Peter, please go ahead. I feel like that puts a lot of pressure on me. <laughs> um, <laughs> better be a good question. It's, well, Chris, I just want to thank you that the way you describe the problem and the kinds of things you're thinking about in terms of solutions track really closely with things I've been thinking about. So I appreciated that. My question is actually about what you didn't say. At one point, you said there are various correlational approaches or alternatives off stage. And I, yeah, I wanted to hear more about those alternatives. Oh, okay. I'm going to be getting quite out of my depth here quite quickly. But what I was sort of pointing to really was if we're trying to predict, you know, what species are we going to see in the future given a particular temperature in a particular place? You know, one answer to that is to try and use all the coexistence theory stuff. But another answer is to use maybe joint species distribution models or something else that builds into that. Um, I think I'll stop at that point before I go too far into deep water that I don't know. But that, that's kind of the thing in that I don't think we should imagine that coexistence theory is the only game in town for this sort of stuff. And so just because you know we can use it doesn't necessarily mean it is the answer to a particular problem. Um, sorry, I suppose it's a bit of a disappointing answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> so were there any particular models that you were thinking of that you maybe thought I was referring to? Or <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, thanks so much. And uh, Steve, please go ahead. Um, thanks. Um, so again, yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, um, you've provided empirical justification for a lot of things I've been worried about for no reason. <laughs> so <laughs> other than yeah, it, seemed the like they, like, it seemed like these had to be problems, but now lo and behold, we know that they are. Um, uh, um, I'll make two comments, one pessimistic, one optimistic, and to <laughs> ask for your reactions. Um, the pessimistic one is, it seems to me that this undercuts all applications of theory to community ecology, that the only difference um, about competition theory, or coexistence theory, is that we have a theory. And this is you know, sort of what you're undercutting is any use of models um, to describe what, to figure out what's going on in real communities? Or is there something special about coexistence theory that makes it especially difficult? Um, I think and... it's probably the, the opposite in some ways, and that there's nothing special about coexistence theory that gets us off the hook with dealing with these issues that, that are there. Um, but like we, well, I'm in, the, I'm in the optimistic camp on that front in that if we're sort of aware of these things and kind of, make clear the limits of where we're at, then we're not going to be so surprised as if we're a bit off. <laughs> like, okay. Um, sorry. Um, um, yeah. Um, and um, the my more optimistic one was that I really like your last point on the outlook. Because I think making probabilistic predictions, this super sensitivity to model selection goes away if you're trying to predict frequency distributions. Um, the trouble uh, that I and Peter and my friends have had with expected persistence time 
is that they're so long. How do you compute them? It seems like it's 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 what we'd like to do, but it's computationally infeasible because if a species is coexisting, you 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 know you can't do the simulations to estimate persist expected persistence time with any accuracy. Yes, and so hence the experiment I did. I put quite a heavy, you know, temperature increase, and you know, so I really, I was those were going extinct, right? And so the the question I set was, you know, the the time as the temperature changes, which, in some ways, introduces a lot of problems, but it lets me get an answer out. <laughs> um, mm. I mean, in general, for standard kind of coexistence problems, then. When we haven't got a changing environment, then yeah, it's it's actually much much harder because either the answer is the expected efficiency time is something enormous, whatever that be, and actually the difference between very enormous and somewhat enormous is probably not not too important really, even if it's orders of magnitude difference. Once it's over a threshold, it's you know it's there, um, which doesn't necessarily interact well with the kind of analysis we want to do, but then maybe puts into the category of things that it's like well not a problem and such we kind of want to know we're most interested in empirically often the, the species that are on the cusp and then so maybe they will have a value that is actually a, a bit more meaningful and a bit more accessible that's, that's a very optimistic response to an already optimistic question i guess so um, I, i'm sure there'll be others who'll think that's nonsense but um, that's my okay thing. thanks Thank you very much. Uh, Liz, you had a question. Please go ahead. Yes. So my first question is that uh, concerns these Drosophila experiments, that what do they compete for so in your a, system? So most of the competition is within the larvae, in that they're, um, you know, they all, both eat the same food, they slide over each other, they do seem to kind of attack each other a bit, they definitely interact. And there's a little bit of the adults compete for, it's almost they compete for kind of space to, to lay eggs because there's so many and you can, they kind of cover the whole food, they're bouncing up and down. It might yeah. not be so much a direct contest. They more kind of, they bother each other. They don't like being jumped on by other species, which you know, fair enough. Um, Would it help you if you, if you knew more about the mechanism of of this competition, that how the, the temperature changes the behavior uh, of the flies, and uh, uh, how does it affect uh, the difference uh, in in their behavior? Uh, so we, uh, the temperature. How does the temperature uh, affect the difference in their behavior? And what is the essential difference between them? Why one of them is more tolerable to higher temperatures than the other? So these being Drosophila, you know, we know a huge amount in lots of ways. I mean, these species maybe aren't particularly well studied themselves, but obviously Melanogaster, you can, you know, someone will know the effect of every temperature on every gene or something somewhere. But, but I think the purpose is for here is actually trying to abstract over that a little bit in the, the kind of experiments you want to do, just absorb all of that. Really. So the problem uh, I see here is the way of abstraction. Uh, uh, Richard Levins would be very happy to see this your Drosophila experiment with the temperature <laughs> effect, as he used this example in his paper about uh, the way of abstraction. So uh, just to reply uh, to the former question of Stephen, that I think that the problem is with the implicity of uh, of these uh, models. It is very far from the mechanisms of competition. And uh, so this, these models are um, uh, not explicit, but, but implicit model, models do not uh, uh, connect individual behavior with the uh, um, uh, with the competition coefficient and uh, and so on. So uh, uh, if so, so uh, my problem, so the existential problem for me, the whole uh, approach of the coexist modern coexistence uh, theory is that it is very general, uh, but this is not mechanistic at all. It partition fitness into components which are interrelated. See papers of Yuri. Uh, with uh, with others as well, so uh, so it means that 
that a way out uh, to to make explicit uh, the reg the feedbacks uh, working in the systems and learn about the feedbacks uh, to to the uh, to divide the computation coefficients into impact and sensitivity as uh, Giza does uh, because this gives you a way to relate to um, individual behavior into the mechanism which work uh, within the system and that and then the next question will be that that if you are in a natural community uh, which is uh, extremely big and with many many components that what is the good way uh, to just uh, identify uh, parts of this uh, which can be analyzed in itself okay yeah, so matching, it's um, yeah, matching these scales is absolutely crucial i mean in here i with this experiment i presented in the second half i exactly match the scales just between the, what i'm fitting and with the kind of thing i'm trying to predict that's definitely cheating right <laughs> it's sort of very yeah. very unlikely to ever really this really here uh, would uh, would be essential yeah but okay. is missing uh, in your and particularly dispersal is, is, is huge, you say. And we yeah, yeah, yeah. know that these species arrive at, a, you put a, a rotten fruit bait out, different species arrive at different times. Some of them get there first. And then yeah, 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 bigger yeah. ones come. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. It's absolutely classic dispersal trade-off things. You know, that's what definitely happens in the wild. Um, I mean, we kind of bounce back and forth with trying to replicate the wild and just using them as, a, um, you know, as an example. But yeah, it's definitely part of it. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. No, it no. was very, very useful and very, very nicely done and <laughs> followable. And nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. So there are two questions. So Will wants to ask a question, but I'm also mentioning that in the chat there was a. Yes, I spotted that one. I think I think Will was first though. Um, if that's we're trying to go in rough order. <laughs> sure. Hey, nice talk, Chris. I really enjoyed that. Um, I was curious if you've done an, any sort of uncertainty analysis, or put another way, if I was an empiricist and wanted to do a better job predicting better, like what what would be the most useful input of effort in terms of what type of data I would collect to make a better, more precise prediction that perhaps better match the data. That's it's quite interesting, Gus. I've been trying to do this i submitted a proposal to kind of do try and do some simulations of exactly that and it got it got firmly rejected so we'll have to i'll have to get back to that i think that's absolutely a really really important question in that we don't really know where we need to invest our effort and um it's quite hard to answer because often in most real cases we only actually have any information at all on some of the possible options so and it tends to be you know what people may be taking a guess at, at. So maybe it's the relevant bits, but we don't actually know. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I I have nothing to say to that, but hopefully, hopefully at some point soon. No, that's great. I'm glad to hear that you're thinking about it, and uh, maybe <laughs> we can talk more about it. Yeah, it'd be great actually. Uh, thanks, and Janne, please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, I wanted to attend this uh, seminar uh, because uh, I've learned that. Uh, in ecology, you've uh, for quite a long time been trying to find the correct model for population cycles. <laughs> correct. And, uh, be, um, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Vaguely functioning would be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I had a, a few years ago an idea that uh, what if population cycles would be driven by an innate chronobiological mechanism so that they wouldn't be created by environmental interactions, but uh, through through a biological clock that is common in the population. Have you ever had that thought? I've, I've not really worked too much on, on cycles. I would say to that, that's probably going to be quite hard to align with some of the data in that there does seem to be quite a strong environmental driver to lots of like the classic cycles. Um, one of the old hypotheses for cycles that come up was a kind of stress, like a biological stress hypothesis. And that's kind of taken a bit of a backseat, but I'm that's a bit out of my range, to be honest. Maybe someone else who's, st who's still kind of gamely in the, in the chat might be able to say something a bit more. Um, it would be quite hard to have a, um, a mechanism that works across enough scale that gives you that. 
Um, but probably the, the case of might be maybe cicadas and things, but I'm I'm fishing here, so yeah, I can't answer too much more. <laughs> what what kind of a light schedule did you have uh, for the flies? So Is we kept 12, 12? 12, 12, 12, 12. Um, and you know we had lots of different incubators, so there are lots of fun of trying to make sure the fluorescent tubes match and all of that. But um, because yes, they're super super um, sensitive to light flies they they need to sleep like everyone else and um it can really stress them if they get the wrong light setup um they can get jet lagged like we can in order this so um yes it worked on that I mean, the noise we didn't those time series i showed they're not really cycles they were more just sort of noise carnage should we say rather than um any kind of nice kind of fluctuations so i'm, I'm not sure it would quite inform what you're asking too much i'm afraid yeah, uh, well, if I can uh, tell a little bit more about the idea, the idea is that uh, the phases of the cycle would be driven by uh, different hormone cycle oscillations. So first, uh, the sex hormones or whatever the hormone for reproduction is in the species, it goes up. And uh, after that, growth hormones go up and because the animals tend to get bigger during mid cycle and so forth. So that's the idea. I mean, evolutionary driven cycles are definitely a thing, actually. Um, I mean, there's, there's um, actually Stephen Ellen has just left, but he's done some work on that, which creates cycles that are driven by evolution back and forth. But that's across species, not within in some ways. But that might be something to have a look at. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, Giza, please go ahead. Thank you for the lecture from, uh, 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 I got the difficulties of, of the problem. <laughs> and uh, 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 my, not independently from uh, uh, Liz, uh, I have a feeling uh, that uh, this, uh, 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 this field is lost in, in mathematics in some sense. Uh, uh, the simplest example. What is the simplest example of square systems? The bird eat the small uh, seed or the large seed. This is the uh, easy thing we understand it. Now, if we uh, want to approach in this way and measure uh, the uh, the invasion coefficient, uh, either do uh, measure this or uh, build a, a detailed models of uh, uh, of uh, uh, food consumptions uh, with many parameters. Of course, we can, uh, in principle, can calculate and predict whether uh, these birds uh, can or cannot coexist in the real world, in a, depending on the weather and the uh, food distribution. Uh, and nobody tried to uh, uh, do this because everybody is satisfied with the understanding that the uh, small beak is, is the small seed and large beak is the large seed. No, if we are uh, uh, considering uh, uh, coexistence maintained by uh, fluctuation, then everybody uh, start to consider the uh, the uh, uh, covariance uh, uh, of uh, some quantities which are complicatedly defined and measure it and uh, conclude that uh, it maintains the coexistence. Uh, uh, but I think it's uh, what really happening is that uh, if uh, our plants uh, 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 consume the resources in different uh, uh, periods, then it's essentially the same uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, resource segregation based coexistence. And uh, it, it could be understood in intuitively, but nobody tried because. Uh, 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 we are occupied with the covariance and uh, and the invasion, uh, uh, this and this and that. And, and but uh, what is missing uh, uh, for me is the uh, uh, maintain uh, uh, interaction between our biological common sense and the mathematical description. Uh, if uh, uh, and uh, if uh, and uh, 
uh, because of uh, it, the whole thing uh, looks uh, so mathematical and depending uh, so critically on uh, on this model fitting or that model fitting, uh, people are not sufficiently interested to understand what is uh, happening in a specific ecosystem and uh, under, uh, and to understand what each species are doing in this context and uh, in what sense are differentiated and so on. This, uh, this is my feeling with the state of this art. Yeah, I, I don't think I disagree. <laughs> no, but, um, it's hard to summon, I mean, there's no way we're going to be able to measure every parameter and every species and every place and all the yes. rest. Um, I think I sort of touched on it a little bit is that if we have enough kind of tent poles of the things we study well, we might be able to draw quite wide links between the two by whether it's through traits, whether it's through phylogeny, whether it's through, you know, whatever. Um, I think we're such a while off that though, if you say like trying to get, draw this across and together is not, not going to be straightforward. Um, I don't know. How, how optimistic are you, Giza? <laughs> Giza? <laughs> I don't know. Um, Liz wanted to say something. They're not very optimistic, but yeah, Liz. <laughs> uh, that um, um, I, I would, uh, I, I just would like to say that what kind of approach. Uh, uh, seems to be uh, more followable uh, from an empirical point of view. So I don't think that we necessarily have to run into the problem that we have to uh, measure too many things and uh, too many parameters, and then we shall have the same problems that you just mentioned before, because there will be many problems. But uh, for instance, Peter Turchin uh, uh, was, had, has got such a... Uh, a Ooh, that's cut out for me. I don't Oops, know if it has to um, me yeah. too. <laughs> uh, oh, I think we might have lost. I, maybe she will come back. Axel, uh, yeah, my, until Liz comes back, I just wanted to um, say I, I think, yes, we run into problems, but these problems are, are rather well known by now that we cannot, we have rubber strawberries modeling maybe more than two or three species. Um, and there is a solution, which is to model 100 species or 1,000 species, because then things become much simpler. And um, that's, that will be the topic of the next presentation. <laughs> <laughs> what a good link. It's a very different question, though, I guess, right? But yes, yeah, it's whether we should chase the things, or we should only chase the things we're fairly sure we can get an answer to, or whether we should, yeah, how much to respond to things that people are asking us or whether we should provide the answers that we know we can. I guess there's a bit of a bit of a challenge there. Um, I, I think Liz is back. Um, I think so too. <laughs> um, my connection was lost. Yes. That's why I disappeared and now I came <laughs> back. So if I if if I make uh, complete the argument that uh, so uh, he, he could connect different levels for the individual level and the population level. And, uh, and uh, in that sense, uh, uh, his models were, uh, were uh, 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 not implicit, but explicit. And uh, um, he was not interested in that much in competition, but in, in uh, the population dynamics, fluctuations, chaotic fluctuations, and so on. So it is not directly uh, linked uh, uh, to these uh, coexistence problems, but the, the approach, I, uh, then, then you know the basic biology of the system. But without that, uh, I don't think that, uh, that um, uh, something that uh, can be used at the applied level um, can be achieved. It's possible, isn't it? <laughs> um... That's an opinion. Can, can yeah. I actually ask a simple question on, on, on that? So, Chris, is it possible to give a one-sentence summary as for what your two Drosophila species differ in? Uh, 
ecologically uh, in those test tubes? Um, what would I say? They they definitely differ in their thermal op performance, should we say, in that Polidifrons is stressed at high temperature and Pandora is not. In terms of how they differ in terms of resource use, there's nothing that we can really see clearly. I mean, so it, because it, then, then it's a, it, it's yeah. a bit of an interesting that 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 you do see that they coexist, right? In 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 some of the in between region. Yes, because I think part of it is they get bothered by having other species around. They lay fewer eggs, but they seem to almost get more bothered if there's too many of the same species around. In that the males basically bother the females so much they can't lay any eggs. There's a bit of that. There's there's all this other sort of stuff that I think possibly isn't that unrealistic. Actually, you get these sort of behaviors going on in kind of a watching. So, so I, 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 I'm pretty thanks for that's actually a great insight. I think that's what Geza and Liz are asking, like, how confident are you that that is the mechanism that is driving the coexistence when you observe it? I I have I have no sense of exactly what it is exactly I I don't know and um I I guess dividing these different possible things up is probably possible you could let them you could split the egg laying from the kind of rearing so you can just count out a particular number of larvae or eggs you know at whatever stage you want and then and then see um I kind of think we don't need the mechanism though for the purpose we're looking at here I think if this theory is ever going to be successful we sort of have to abstract out a bit um but yeah it would be great to know what it was really so we can talk about it um but uh, actually what i have in my mind which is i don't think is the same concern that that Giza and Liz have is, is can we even know or is it very elusive in many real cases because in, in, of course when the bird some birds eat the lar large seeds and some eat the small seeds that's clear cut Mm -hmm. uh, our, how common is a clear cut case? I guess is is what I'm wondering in general, and it's difficult to know because there are so many species out there. And, uh, yeah, and I mean, this is when it goes back to when I was talking about how important the multi species things are. In that we we think so much about grasslands where we've got you know all these species all doing all sorts of various things we can't follow, but actually for a bunch of species it probably is closer to the birds' case in that. There'll be some overlap for a particular resource, and actually, we we maybe could follow that through. Um, it's but then for good practical reasons, we focus on things like flies and grassland species because we can we can study those um, rather than necessarily being the most interesting, should we say? Maybe well, they're interesting. Ah, anyway. that, that, they're like, that's, a, that's a very good point. Okay. They're most um, universal, maybe. I don't yeah. know. Mm -hmm. Um, like they're weird. That's why, and that's why we study them. It's because they have these properties that make them weird. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if it that itself is a research program to to map out how often is it a clear cut case? Like, like if if a <laughs> well trained biologist looks at it, can they just tell what, yeah. what are the key players <laughs> in terms of uh, population limitation regulation? I should say. I have no answers. I'm just saying. No, it would be really interesting, actually. Um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't want to guess, though. No. <laughs> These are being recorded. <laughs> anyway, Liz, if you have a final thought on that. Um, I just wanted to make the remark that uh, uh, in those uh, camostat systems, uh, which are extremely simple, and Stephen Alner left uh, for instance in their system we just know the mechanism we know the trade-off that maintains uh, the two algal species uh, mm. uh, together so um, uh, it is not uh, or uh, when when there is partial segregation as in this drosophila case um, uh, as well we we know such examples and uh, uh, I agree with uh, with Yuri that it is an unsolved question uh, that how often just one or two uh, uh, factors responsible for segregation. But if you look at evolution and you and if you look at the trade-offs, I have uh, 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 um, uh, an impression, an idea uh, that in most of the cases it is not a diffuse thing, but uh, related to 
uh, uh, to uh, robust uh, uh, differences in something. And that's why I asked about the difference between these two Drosophila species in terms of mechanism, okay? And yeah, and I, I know, Axel, that it will not solve the problems at the uh, big community uh, level. <laughs> Okay, I think on that note, we'll have to stop because we went way over time, although it was really cool and it's going to be online. Uh, so thanks so much, Chris, again, and everybody for partaking. Oh, and thank you. Uh, and uh, we will see you in two weeks for Axel's talk. So see you then. And until then, have a good rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye.